You can find Broad Street Presbyterian Church on Facebook and Instagram. Please like our Facebook page at BSBC Columbus or find us on Instagram at Broad Street underscore church. Follow us for great new content available from anywhere in the world, anytime, day or night. In Psalm 9, we read, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Welcome to worship with the community of the Broad Street Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're worshiping with us today. Our scripture reading is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. And my sermon is entitled, True Greatness. We welcome the Reverend Michael Woods to worship leadership today. Later in worship, Mike will offer the prayer. You may or may not know that Broad Street has an online central hub. The web address is www.bspc.church. The central hub at bspc.church is our online home for all things Broad Street. If you're looking for news, announcements, small group signups, volunteer opportunities, the central hub at bspc.church is the place to go. We hope you'll explore it and give us feedback. Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God. Join me in prayer. Let us pray. God of life, forgive us when we follow paths that do not lead to life, that lead instead to fear or stereotyping or hate, paths that lead to deeper self-judgment, to inner deadness. Forgive us when we forget that you offer us life, life that is abundant and eternal, life that began at the creation of all things. Forgive us, turn us to the right path, and let your light and love flow over us and the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine. God's light shines in you and in your neighbor. Even if we can't feel it or see it, God's light shines. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. God invites us to learn to live together in peace. God invites us to share peace, to be peace. The peace of Christ be with you all. Amen. Good morning, kids. Welcome to Children's Time. As I was getting ready for this morning, I looked at the scripture and it made me think of back when I was a kid and I was a student in a classroom with a teacher. I wanted to be the teacher's favorite. I wanted to be the best at everything I could be. I wanted to be the best reader, the best at math, the best at science, number one door holder, number one line leader. I wanted to be the teacher would say, oh, Brittany, you're the best listener. Oh, Brittany, you're the kindest student. I wanted that teacher to call up my parents every night and say, you're not gonna believe it. Brittany was amazing again, the best. She's my favorite. Do you think that's what happened? No, that is not how it works. I wasn't the best at everything. I was good at some things, not so good at others. The teacher helped me learn and grow and I would get better, but I wasn't the best at everything. It's impossible to be the best at everything. 
And I'm not even sure it's right of me to want to be the favorite to the teacher. But it made me think of the disciples. There are 12 disciples and two of them, James and John, went up to Jesus one day and said, hey Jesus, we have a question for you. We wanna be the best. We wanna be your number one disciples, the best Christians right there at the highest level at your left and your right. Jesus was like, oh James, John, you're so confused. That's not how this whole kingdom of God works. That's not what being a disciple or a Christian is about. How much you achieve, how good of a Christian you are, how the best you can be. No, that's not how God's love and acceptance works. But the other 10 disciples heard James and John and there started to be some arguing. The 12 of them were arguing about who was gonna be better and who was the best and who was the favorite. I can just imagine 12 men in the room fighting to be the teacher's pet. And Jesus, the teacher, was like, stop. Stop this bickering. Being a Christian is about not being the best or the highest or most achieving, but being a servant, giving back, doing the things that maybe not everybody wants to do, helping the poor, being kind to those who maybe don't get kindness a lot in their life, showing compassion and loving your neighbor. Being a Christian isn't the same as all the other areas of our life where we try to get better and better and better and better to be the best. Mm, gotta let that go. See, the thing is about God's love is God loves us for exactly who we are. Some things we'll be good at, some things we won't be so good at. God is calling us each to figure out how to be God's love in the world. And we need to be in prayer and listen for God's call and nudge in our heart and where God's calling us to be and how God's calling us to act. It's not about being Jesus, the teacher's pet. It's not about being the number one Christian or disciple. Gotta let that go. So if you kids like Miss Brittany have ever wanted to be the very best, the number one, I want you to just ball that thought up, make it a paper ball. And then I want you to throw it on the ground. We don't need to be the very best at everything. We're not trying to prove ourselves to anyone. We need to be who we are, exactly who we are, and work on our kindness, and love and generosity and compassion. God is proud of you for exactly who you are today. You don't need to be any better, just be who you are. Gracious God, your word gives shape and direction to our lives. Open our hearts and minds to your wisdom and understanding this day so that we may respond to your promises in what we do and what we say. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. 
James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the 10 heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lorded over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every year when our children were growing up, a friend hosted a festive Christmas cookie party in December. For busy moms, the instructions were simple. Come for one hour on a school night. Make four dozen of a favorite Christmas cookie. Bring a container. We swapped out the cookies and everyone left with an amazing assortment. Our kids would be at the door when I arrived home, eager to sample a treat. The party was a family favorite. Baked into our hour together was a competition. We voted on cookies and received awards. My chocolate chip cream cheese bars won, not once or twice, but multiple times. I was the person who won the award for cookie most likely not to make it home in the car. At the cookie party, I stood out. Those chocolate chip cream cheese bars won every time. And I admit it, that felt great. The disciples, James and John, are only doing what we do. They go to Jesus, the source of all good gifts, and ask to occupy places of honor. They want Jesus to make them great. Now we may not be as direct as James and John, but we're all strivers. We see greatness in different ways. Maybe we strive to be the reader of the most books or the best cook or the grower of the biggest pumpkin or the watcher of all episodes of Grey's Anatomy. We may strive through the expectations we place on our children or grandchildren. We may strive through academic recognition or work-related accomplishments. In a sense, we're all children of Zebedee, like James and John. We chase greatness. We want our lives to be better than our parents. We're perpetual achievers. Which brings me back to the cookie party. After many parties, the cookie started to crumble so to speak, because I grew to anticipate winning, to expect greatness, which made me less present in the moment and more concerned about results than taking delight in the company around me. James and John have expectations of Jesus. They want to be seated next to him in glory, to be made great. It sounds ludicrous, but they ask, 
And then the other disciples get angry at them, presumably because they want to be great too. In their regular lives, none of them have achieved greatness. None of them have been awarded fishermen of the year. The reality is that they have given up everything to follow Jesus. Right before our reading, the gospel writer Mark describes the scene. The 12 have been walking toward Jerusalem. Jesus walks ahead, striding with purpose. Then he takes them aside and tells them what's going to happen, that he'll be handed over to the powers that be, that he'll be mocked, flogged, killed, and in three days rise again. It's too much to take in. This actually is the third time Jesus has tried to tell them these things, and each time the disciples struggle to absorb it. They don't share his sense of purpose. They're afraid. They long for security. They need something they can hang on to. I'm going to say that again. They're afraid. They long for security. They need something they can hang on to. That sounds a lot like our lives these days. As one of you said recently, last year we managed the pandemic. This year we're managing the pandemic plus, and that plus, it's fraught. Friends and family refusing vaccines, unrest at school board meetings, threats to democracy, aggression on the road, plus, plus, plus. We're fragile. We're worried. More than that, we're anxious. Many find themselves seized by free-floating anxiety, unable to sleep at night. I'm wondering if James and John have listened to Jesus more than we realize. Maybe they understand what's coming. And in the face of that, maybe they just want to know that things will be okay. Maybe they long for the promise of a secure future. I hear that because, well, I long for that too. A little certainty feels like a good thing. And life doesn't give us a lot of security and certainty these days. Jesus doesn't offer certainty either. What he offers is relationship. He offers himself, his presence. That's enough for the disciples. They don't go home. They stay with him. They keep following him. They show up as they are, imperfect and afraid. Jesus calls us to flip our usual attitudes toward greatness and honor and fame upside down. Our normal perspective is to look at life from the top down, to give energy and attention to people who have competed with one another and come out on top. We do this with sports figures and singers, actors and artists, as well as with politicians and business leaders. We are drawn to their fame and impressed by their talents and accomplishments. Jesus comes along and says, for the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus wonders if James and John know what they are asking. Are they able to drink the cup that he will drink or be baptized with his baptism? Those words are metaphors for his death. James and John answer, we are able, but we know that's not true. When the pressure builds, they will run. They will fail Jesus. They aren't able, at least not yet. In the Acts of the Apostles, we learn that James was martyred in Jerusalem by Herod Agrippa in the year 44 of the Common Era. Their failures during Jesus' life are not the final word about their faithfulness. They will have other chances. They run away during his suffering, but later their suffering will be as awful as his. 
Jesus says, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. That's an extraordinary promise. Jesus is saying, you will not always be driven by your fears and your need for security. Instead, you will be empowered to take up your cross and follow me. You will have an opportunity to be faithful even to the end. Jesus makes that promise to all disciples then and now. This message of the cross is hard to hear. Jesus' death challenges a self-centered individualistic understanding of discipleship. He invites all of us as disciples to do some self-reflection on our own drive toward greatness. For us to get where God wants us to be, Jesus comes along and disorients us. He helps us detach from what is destructive and negative. His teachings invite us to question where the currents of daily life are taking us in contrast to where he wants to take us. There's nothing wrong in wishing to be great in God's eyes, but true greatness isn't measured by how much others notice and admire us. It's not measured through status or power or position. True greatness in God's eyes is to be a servant. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. He spent his life, he gave his life for others. He teaches us to serve. And that can be a sacrifice because we all have Zebedee DNA. As faith matures, so do our questions. We start by asking, God, let me tell you what I want you to do for me. By grace, over time, our asking shifts. Lord, tell me what I can do for you. What can I do to serve my neighbor and to live out my faith with kindness, openness, empathy, and compassion? Lord, tell me what I can do for you. God is in the business of transforming disciples so that we can serve at least some of the time and not be served all of the time. Even when we long for security, when we need something to hang on to, even when we're afraid, God knows our longings, our uncertainties, and our fears. God is with us in spirit because God knows we aren't actually seeking greatness as much as closeness. God knows we don't need certainty as much as relationship. May God reshape our understanding of true greatness and strengthen us so that we can live in this upside down way. Amen.
We hold in our hearts all we have just seen as we come to pray. Loving, gracious God, we come to you as we so often do, knowing you have compassion for the suffering of this world and that you will hear the prayers of your people. And whatever answer you may have for us is one that comes out of your infinite wisdom of what is best. We give you thanks for that wisdom, for the gift of your grace, and that you have instilled into our hearts the same love and compassion for the human race that you have. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, dear God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, that you have created us in your image and that we are united with one another, but separate as individuals. We give you thanks for the diversity of human cultures, for the variety of different languages that give us different ways of seeing and knowing you in the world in which we live. May we always cherish the uniqueness of one another as the gift you have intended for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this world, mindful of the ways that our own actions contribute to its many problems, poverty, racism, warfare, climate change. May you empower us with courage to use the gifts you have given to us to solve these problems and to work together for the common good of all humankind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up in prayer our friends and our neighbors. We pray for all who are broken, who are in need, who struggle with addiction, who are filled with grief, who are in need of the healing that only you can give them. May your power surround them. May your loving arms embrace them and your peace, which surpasses our ability to comprehend it, fill them completely. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. By your grace, we are given confidence of being your children. And so we join together, praying the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you go into the week ahead, may God reshape our understanding of true greatness and give us strength to live in this upside down way. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen.